Hi, class. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sorry I couldn't be there today for our lecture, but I thought we might as well still learn. So today I'm going to be talking about the American relationship to the land. <clears throat> All right, your test is still on Friday. All right. The American relationship with the land stems from our, from our view of nature as property. Americans see the land as their provider, one that gives us everything but receives nothing in return. Our land ethic is built on consumerism. But can you really blame us when our success in a society is reflected on our monetary success? I don't think so. Aldo Leopold says that the land ethic, in the land ethic, that, that there is yet no ethic dealing with man's relation to the land and to the animals and the plants which grow upon it. Land, like Odysseus's slave girls, is still property. The land relation is still strictly economic, entailing privileges but not obligations. <coughs> Excuse me. Since environmentalism first became a discussion, Americans have been able to choose one of three schools of thought to shape their land ethic. A land ethic, as defined by Leopold, is as a kind of community instinct in the making. The land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of community to include soils, waters, plants, and animals, or collectively the land. The three core American t schools of thought in which one could identify with are preservationists, conservationists, environmentalists, or one could choose not to align their beliefs with any of these movements. Often this is because they don't believe in the science behind these groups' arguments. And today, we refer to these people often as climate deniers. John Muir, <coughs> excuse me. John Muir is one of the most well-known American preservationists. His beliefs stem from the idea that all creatures are equal and divine. Preservationists believe that the land is for everyone and that no man is superior to nature. Muir asks, why should man value himself as more than the, a small part of one great unit of creation? And what creature of all that the Lord has taken the pains to make is not essential to the completeness of that unit? He believes that our relationship with nature should not be centered around man. It should not be selfish. And that we need to preserve nature for the sake of all that is beautiful and divine. Muir argues that man is using nature, sort of like a store. We're taking things from it, cotton and iron and lead, to make what we need, but we never return what we've taken. Even in Muir's time, Americans saw nature as a commodity. Conservationists, on the other hand, people like Gifford Pinchot, saw the conservation of natural resources as the only permanent basis of national success. In this way, conservationists' relationship to nature fits more with with the, the American publics. <clears throat> Sorry, guys, I'm pretty, pretty sick. We feel no obligation to our environment unless our way of life is to be threatened. As Pinshaw said, we have been in the habit of declaring certain of our resources to be inexhaustible. We are naive, and when we realize the damages we are doing and that we are threatening our comforts, we become scared. I think that what drives many Americans' relationship with nature is fear. For urbanites and suburban suburbians, is a fear of the wild, of the untamed world. And for many of us, it is a fear of our own mistakes. Just look at what we're doing to our land with pesticides and such. 2.5 million tons of pesticides are being used each year in industry. But many Americans didn't take notice of this problem till it started to cause illness in human beings. A recurring theme throughout our study of American land ethic, which I hope all of you picked up on by now, and our relationship with nature is our misconception of superiority over nature. Time and time again, nature displays to us its power, in the form of natural disasters, drought, or even, let's say, the Dust Bowl, perhaps, where the land was wrecked by human interference and the earth showed its dominance over mankind. In civil disobedience, Thoreau mocks men who put themselves on a level with wood and earth and stone. That is where environmentalism movement begins. It gained tremendous support in the 1960s and 70s during a period where 
much legislation was protect, excuse me, passed to protect our resources as well as the beauty of our land. A marriage between conservationism and preservationism, environmentalism as a, was as political as it was radical. It came during a period of reconstruction, one could argue, in the American society, with civil rights and women's rights and all that sort of stuff. It was based on the ideas of separatism from big business and the protection of our ever-changing environment. There are many ways to connect with the land, but for generations, the connection has been dwindling. Look at all you kids. You're probably watching me on your laptops right now. As our communication becomes increasingly dependent on technology, our language no longer is driven by nature, as Emerson suggests it once was. Americans' relationship with nature is becoming enormously scheduled and extremely commercialized. To reevaluate for all you kids with a very short, short attention span, America's relationship with nature comes from the idea of nature as property and the idea that we, as human beings, have the right almost manifest destiny of sorts to own our land. Thanks, guys. Have a nice evening. Be good.